try to impose it on their life, and I think that's why it's not working so well. So that's a statement. So I would... Um, I guess I would like to be able to... change my mindset to better understand uh, the way of life of people who live in uh, informal settlements. So you'd like to better create a solution. Okay. If I can understand the perspective of a squatter, I'm more likely to be able to come up with an architectural solution. So can you help me with that in this lecture? How can we overcome this judgmental relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's awkward. Right? Okay. So do you guys have a, uh, a clear s sense of what you need, what you can expect from your education in the next hour and a half? Okay. Um, okay. Well, I will do my best. <coughs> Um, and uh, uh, I'm nervous about all the laptops that are open. Um, it makes me want to walk back here and confirm that you're taking notes. I mean, this is awkward. This is awkward. Are you taking notes? <laughs> Taking notes is cool. Rabbit's not cool. <coughs> so if you're taking notes, great. If you're not taking notes, please close your device. Are you taking notes, Kai? So, so remember this global population thing? Uh, I showed it uh, in the red form, but last night I went and we have an update. And uh, what's this point called, 2100? What is it? Yes, thank you, keep human. Um, so this is peak human. And um, previous predictions had it hitting um, somewhere around 10. That's about here, around 2060. So that's been my reference point. Is I, I was, my, the prior predictions were, were curves were something like, like this. Um, hitting peak human around 10 in 2060. But what happened since that prediction that would drive it up to 11 uh, around 2110? Do you remember what the biggest single factor of population growth is? Well, education. Education of who in particular? Females. Women and girls in what continent in particular? Africa. Africa, thank you. 
So it turns out that um, you can actually be an architecture student at Wentworth and already be having an impact on this. Uh, I have a thesis advisee, um, Jackie Aguiar. Do you know Jackie? Yeah. So Jackie is, uh, Jackie and her family, a bunch of women, are going off, all of her, uh, her extended family are nurses and doctors and all, and they're going back to their, uh, where their family comes from, which is Ghana, and they're gonna be providing health care, and Jackie wants to do her part, so she is gonna, uh, gonna build a school that teaches um, the youth in Ghana, in this one place in Ghana, uh, how to build. So it's gonna be a maker education school, and the thing they're gonna do before they build the school, they're gonna start the school, and the children are gonna build the school themselves. They're gonna to learn to build. So in doing that, she is driving this uh, towards here in a very real way. How cool is that? Who'd have thought that uh, a Wentworth student would have an impact on one of the biggest single forces occurring uh, on the planet, right? I think that is so cool. So um, with apologies uh, on behalf of the discipline, Chris. Wait, so you're saying she's driving up back? No, by, by bringing her architectural education uh, to bear uh, on the ground in Ghana in the name of education, and it'll, there will be more girls in these classes than boys, she, is, she and her family are contributing to increasing the educational attainment of the next generation of uh, Ghanaian females. And that turns out to be the single largest factor for reducing uh, the birth rate that is in Africa, which is having the biggest impact on this curve. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, it's a good thing. She's, she's helping drop peak human to be closer to 10 billion than 11 billion, and closer to 2060 than 2110. Is that strictly just because like, we can like, sustain that many people? Well, it turns out we can. It's just one factor. It turns out that sustainability uh, isn't just um, the number of people. It's the number of people times, I'm gonna use use that symbol because there's already an X there, times the impact. And the impact is often measured in energy or carbon. Um, but it turns out the impact is proportional to uh, consumption. So, and we don't have good data on carbon. We don't have good data on energy. We do have excellent global data on consumption. So uh, we use consumption measured in dollars, US dollars, uh, as a stand-in for impact per person. And that equals uh, the total um, X. And then there's a question, if X exceeds is greater than uh, the carrying capacity of the planet, which I like to, I've made up a new, this is all out of my delusional brain. I'm gonna call it E, and that stands for the carrying capacity of the Earth, right? It's a, it's a unit of measure. Uh, one Earth uh, carrying capacity. If, if X exceeds E, then, you all took math, right? This is more computer science logic. Then, then oopsie daisy. Right. Else, else repeat. 
So until, until x exceeds e, we just keep repeating what we're doing. But when x is greater than e, then oopsie, we've exceeded one of the nine planetary thresholds that we looked at in the first lecture. Remember those nine planetary thresholds? Yes. So this is, oopsie is to be avoided. And as soon as you reduce the number of people, uh, you've reduced a multiplier uh, in terms of consumption. Now at the same time, capitalism is doing everything, is, capitalism is mobilizing humanity. It is the grand organizing force of humanity to uh, drive up that number. That's the profit incentive is to increase that number. Um, and so Jackie's, this graph is just this factor. The rest of the course is how to house, clothe, feed, educate, uh, keep healthy everybody in the world um, so that human well-being goes up while impact goes down. It's what you guys think of as sustainability. And in your other classes, you talk about um, leadership in energy. What's LEAD stand for? Leadership in energy and environmental development. Thank you, Mo. Leadership in energy and environmental development. And so LEAD. And so we're going to talk about LEAD in comparison to um, the impact. Uh, because is lead enough? Is lead going to do the job? No. Yeah, it'll, it'll, tiny, tiny little bit. Thank you. Thank you for lead. But we're going to look at uh, what is lead in comparison to impact that sits in the portfolio of your professional lives. That's an interesting topic. Good question. So most things that you will read about cities, uh, and any architectural literature that talks about the future, they're going to talk about. They're going to. They're going to talk about. They're going to say in the United States, the size of our cities is increasing dramatically, and by 2025, or by 2030, right? This is as far as architects seem to be able to see. They can't see beyond five or ten years in the future. Sorry about this. And, especially in the United States, architectural culture is limited uh, in its view to the cities of the United States. I apologize on behalf of the discipline of architecture in North America. I apologize for the invisibility of the rest of the world and for the invisibility of anything beyond uh, 2030. It is pathetic and should piss you off. So when you sit down and you read anything on Arc Daily or anything in architecture that refers to the future, you should be pissed off if it starts with, cities in the United States are expected to grow to, woo, four million, Boston is expected to grow to 1.2 million in population by 2030. We don't have time for this. This is pathetic. How about they, what architects should be talking about is global population between now and peak human. And if they want to talk about cities, which that's what we're here for, let's talk about um, the population of cities around the world. And if we're from the United States, we think in aggregate. we. We are trained, we are conditioned to not think about distribution because uh, distribution is awkward and it, it causes pain um, because it's embarrassing. And so we tend not to talk about distribution as well. Um, but I think this is the graph that starts to uh, have uh, relevance uh, to be truly responsible citizens. We have to think globally. We have to think about cities. Uh, we have to think about peak human time frames. And we have to think about distribution. So this is a graph of 
uh, urban populations uh, or populations of the world and how many are urban squatters. So right now we're about um, 1.7 billion uh, squatters uh, in the world and by 2050 it's going to be 3.5 and so going back to this graph this 3.5 is uh, needs to be updated by the time we get to peak human um, it appears that we are on track for a 4 billion squatter world if peak human if peak human is in 20 110 at 11 billion, we're all friends, so let's just round it off. Then we're heading for a peak human condition of 4 billion out of 11 billion people are squatters. Not quite a majority. Connor. Okay. Now, what's the distribution of that? <coughs> it matters. And so, um, how do squatters happen? Internal displacement has been something that's been happening throughout human history. But for some reason, despite the fact that the total, you may not believe this, but uh, people are doing better than they ever have in human history. There's less poverty than at any previous point in human history. There is less uh, large warfare than any time in previous human history. But at the same time, while that is still true, there is more and more internal displacement from conflict and violence uh, than has ever been the case before. So part of this has to do with global climate change. The whole Syrian, have you heard about Syria? Bad stuff happening, right? Bad stuff happening in Syria. Does anyone want to give a quick summary? One sentence takeaway of Syria? It's a war. A war. Very bad. It's a civil war. It's involving Russia, the United States, Iran, Turkey. ISIS, Turkey. Turkey. Oh my God, Turkey. Um, so it's, it's a very bad situation. It is primarily uh, a problem with It's not even on here. I guess 2012. It's on here. Where is it? See it. Look in the Indian Ocean. Right in Iraq. At least three million. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. The red square moved. So that's going. Okay. <coughs> Syria. Right next to Turkey. And right next to Iraq. Uh, and there's Iran. So um, it is largely caused by drought. It triggered a civil war. The civil war has involved the global powers, uh, and now it's a hot potato, uh, uh, and it's a very serious conflict. Yes? Uh, do you think claims like, uh, like you were just making, um, like there's less poverty and there's less wars in like the grand scheme of human history at this point, do you see those as like cover-ups and kind of, because whenever I hear people say that, I think it's kind of this big cover-up to say, like, oh, like, we're just so much better than we were before when really we're just facing new, bigger problems than like, war or the level of poverty. That is the appropriate, educated response. Thank you. Does everyone get that? When people say, uh, there's less poverty and less war than ever before in human history, and then there's a period at the end of that sentence. Uh, it should trouble you. It's not that it's not true. It's incomplete. We li you are inheriting a world where truth is a tricky business, and that was never true before. Truth is a tricky business. It's not enough, and this is where the Buddha comes in and is a useful reference point. It's not enough to make sure the thing you're saying is true. It also has to be useful and not harmful. It is concretely harmful to state partial truths in this case, to 
to make everybody who should be concerned about the state of the world uh, relax and just sit back and, and binge watch their next Netflix series, that is a problem. Yes, there is less war, less violence, less poverty than ever before in human history, but we have serious stuff coming down the pipeline at us, head on. And so uh, it is not okay to finish the sentence and put a period there. You need to say but, or you need to say and. And also, there's never before been more internal displacement of people. And when you pull people into cities, who was pulled into Boston to go to college? I think all of you were pulled into Boston. How many were in Boston already? Okay. Does Boston area count? <coughs> sure, why not? We're friends. Um, okay, so who was pulled into Boston to go to college? Who was pushed into Boston to go to college? Did uh, someone show up with a gun and push you? Okay. You were pulled. Who pushed you? Your parents said, go to college. Okay. All right, we'll accept it. But when people move to cities and they are pulled to cities, that is generally a happy thing. Thank you. They tend to come to cities for more opportunity, as you all did, the opportunity of a good education and a, and a great career. You were pulled into the city, and it's been mostly a good thing, right? Compare that to being pushed into cities. You, someone shows up in the middle of the night, uh, you hear gunshots, someone bangs on your door, and they're shouting, and you have to grab whatever you can and hope they don't shoot you as you run into the jungle, right? That is what's going on here. People have never before been pushed off their land in such high numbers. And what do you do when you're pushed off your land? You go to the cities and you see if you can find a place to live. So uh, cities have been growing faster than at any point in history prior. And uh, the largest cities, and this always bothers me because this is an error. Um, Jakarta is actually currently at 27 million. It's an aberration in the uh, counting, uh, the way the administrative counting. It's actually 27 million. It's the second largest city in the world and will be, despite the fact that Indonesia decided that Jakarta is no longer going to be the capital, they're going to build a new capital in the jungles of Borneo um, to get away from the traffic because they can't solve the urban problems. Yes? What's happening in Jakarta? Flooding. Well, people, actually Jakarta is a happy thing. People are getting pulled into the city in Jakarta. But I just wanted to correct this uh, incorrect data. Um, but the places, um, what's happening in Cairo? Are people being pushed into Cairo from anywhere? They're not pushed, but like people want to go to Cairo. So they're being pulled to Cairo. Yeah. Awesome. But uh, people are being pushed out of Syria, and they're largely being pushed into places like Beirut. Okay. People tend to get pushed out of downtowns and to less expensive real estate on the periphery so that their, uh, their travel to work is longer and their access to urban services is more difficult. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but I guess like in terms of Boston, what would you consider now no longer the Boston area? Is it beyond 95? Excellent question, uh, and this is at the core of our study of architecture and urbanism. What is, when we say Boston, what do we mean? There is this municipality with a population of 860,000 people that is labeled Boston. But then there's the Boston, uh, Boston Metropolitan Area Council that puts out this great 
calendar of the year. I thought I had it in my bag, just coincidentally, uh, but I don't. Um, but the MAPC uh, is a consortium of 101 towns and municipalities that is considered the greater Boston area or the Boston statistical area. So these are statistical areas. The city of Tokyo is tiny, but the, the people, the zone of people who are commuting in and out of Tokyo is enormous. And it's mostly possible because they have one of the best transportation systems in the world. They have fantastic high-speed rail. So that's why Tokyo, the catchment area, the economic catchment area of Tokyo makes it the largest city in the world, in part because of its excellent transportation system. Shanghai is uh, close, close behind Tokyo. They built their transportation infrastructure, their mass transit infra infrastructure from scratch starting around 1990. And they have the largest uh, transit system in the world now. It's miraculous transformation. So that's how, when we talk about cities, it, you know, you'd think in a course like this, we'd go back in human history, we'd look at Chata al Hoyuk in uh, Turkey, and we'd say, um, here's what the definition of a city is. But cities are difficult, are, are persistently difficult to define in any categorical manner. But the way we define cities today uh, is, uh, what areas, what populations are actually participating in the economic and social life of these identifiable cores? So as soon as Boston uh, uh, demolishes the MBTA and resurrects it as a functional uh, agency, then Boston will start to enlarge uh, as its public transportation system uh, brings uh, more and more housing online uh, to people who are participating in the Boston economic social system. So you could live in Lynn or Lawrence or Lowell or Fitchburg or Worcester and have an affordable place to live and still get to school in a half hour or so. Because historically since the dawn of human history how long is the commuting time? Half an hour each way. The Romans, it took them in ancient Rome, half hour to get to work. Shanghai, uh, uh, 1,500 years ago, more or less half hour. It's kind of built into the human organic, orga the organism, the in human anatomy, half hour each way. That's what the commute is. How many people commute longer than a half hour each way? This is an indication of a weakness of the urban system. It shouldn't be more than a half hour. You should be able to find an affordable place to live within a half hour of uh, what you need to do. And I blame the governor who refuses to kill the MBTA and create a, a new one. So refugee camps. Uh, <coughs> is an extreme version of squatter settlements. Uh, it's a very dramatic and vivid and visible uh, form of squatter settlement. And so uh, it's, it's, an extreme, it's an extreme situation where people showing up at the city are criminalized, registered, and controlled in a barbed wire enclosed uh, pound, and uh, it's been written about, if you're interested in the kind of philosophical, you know, it's interesting, one of the things I love about this reading is you're talking about Ishmar in one paragraph, and then you bring in Aristotle and Rousseau. It's like this profound human pondering of philosophical dimensions that has to do with land rights and what we do as architects. Um, so if you're interested in the larger philosophical uh, thinking when it comes to refugees, 
uh, I recommend um, the writings of Agamben. I can't remember his first name, but Agamben's uh, literature, he's coined this term, the state of exception. And this gets back to the idea of normal, not normal, which gets to another author. Let me write these down. Um, by the name of Michel Foucault. Have you ever heard of Michel Foucault? So, Michel Foucault came first. Sorry, M. Foucault. French, difficult. Um, if you're a burglar and you're breaking into a rich person's house, uh, this is the 4K TV on the wall. It's difficult reading, but it might be worth it for some of you, if you're interested in filling in the holes of your, of your schooling to satisfy the needs of your education. So Michel Foucault and Agamben. Let me see. So the camps. So it's, um, it's a negative urbanism that um, the camp is a useful reference point because this is a, a, a design. Someone designed these camps. <coughs> Architects designed the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. Uh, and there's a whole literature about that that uh, you might be interested in. But these are the products of our profession, these camps. They are instruments of control. And they are very effective. And they have huge impacts on large numbers of people. Do you remember the Panopticon that we talked about last summer? Michel Foucault, um, that name came up in the theorization of the Panopticon. That's one of his. Uh, central examples of architecture that is used as an instrument of power. And so one of the main missions of this course is to shake architects and architecture generally out of the stupor that it has uh, lapsed into for at least a century. Uh, when I went to school, it was just understood that architecture is the passive reflection of human values. That human values have a life of its own, capitalism, power, politics, society, and then the people who control that real world reality, they hire architects to build buildings that are passive reflections of that situation. And um, People like Michel Foucault and Agamben and uh, people around the world who teach this class in a new way uh, and teach history in a new way, uh, what we do is we look at the examples of where architecture is not just a passive reflection. It's also an active instrument for creating the world as it is. So, uh, without architects to create the concentration camp, without architects to create the mechanisms, the infrastructures of surveillance, the infrastructures of refugee camps, they would not exist the way they do. And when architects uh, provide alternatives that are capable of fulfilling some of the needs without the inhumanity, that's when architects uh, are the negotiators of a transformation in a more positive direction. So we're going to skip some of this. This is Beirut, which turns out to be a mosaic of refugee camps. And if you like um, war movies, there's a lot of Beirut war movie where uh, it's always where the refugees come and the the movements that form in those camps, and you know, there's a lot of spy thriller uh, fiction that occurs in Beirut because it is such, in, uh, because of this urban condition, it's a mosaic of a history 
of refugee camps that went from being camps into pieces of the urban fabric. So where uh, you know, it might have started with a barbed wire chain link fence and uh, armed guards with automatic rifles guarding the one entrance. Uh, eventually, the, they gain rights and they become one of the 27 factions that are uh, vying for power and the barbed wire comes down, the, you know, the streets start to penetrate the, the uh, refugee, well, used to be a refugee camp, and now it's a neighborhood. Uh, did anyone grow up in Beirut? We sometimes have people in the course who lived in Beirut. And you can see that there's, it, it leaves its mark. So this is formal. And uh, you can tell that there's a specific tradition of the built environment because of these black dots. Can you see these black dots in the middle of these uh, whitish shapes? This is the courtyard architecture of the region. And it's a, it's, it's a climate based, but it's also cultural. Uh, there's a religious aspect to it that we will get into in future weeks. Uh, but the the mosaic aspect of the city of Beirut is startling. That this is very different than this. And there are, it, for an equal area, so one square kilometer of this houses about one tenth as many people as one square kilometer of this. So it's a very, very different condition. And those conditions have consequences. So let's get into some detail. Um, there are five conditions that define squatter settlements, slums, or informality. And we like to use the word informal. Uh, although, how many of you have had uh, Ignacio for a studio? Have you talked about informality at all? I guess not. Can you give us an example? Like, did your studio project involve designing for informality? Like, what do you mean by informality? Like, did you have a site that was in uh, Caracas or something? No. Okay. We were in Symphony Hall. Where? Symphony Hall. Symphony Hall. <laughs> oh, no, no, no informality. Well, so Ignacio. So Ignacio is from Caracas, Venezuela, and uh, he's doing a, a, a doctoral dissertation right now about informality. And his thesis is informality is not the right word uh, because it's not informal settlements. There's an awful lot of formal economic engagement that produces the, what we call informal settlements. So in my conversations with Ignacio about informality, and probably next time I should have Ignacio give this lecture because he is one of the world's foremost experts on informal settlements. So I apologize for not having Ignacio deliver this lecture. But I feel obligated to, even as I use the word informal settlements, because slums, that's so negative, right? How, how is it supposed to make someone feel if, if I call the home where they grew up? the slums, right? Let's not do that. Friends don't let friends put down uh, the hometown. So we don't like to use the word slums, so instead we use the word informal settlements. But informal is not really precise, uh, as Ignacio would point out. And I've proposed to Ignacio that we reclaim the term, and instead of calling it informal settlements, we call it instead, wait for it, settlements. Because most settlements throughout human history are, are like this. And it's only, if you take a historical perspective, a historical viewpoint, it's only in a very limited blip of time of human history that this other thing has been, has come to the forefront. Let's call it formal settlements. So instead of settlements and informal settlements, 
let's call it formal settlements and settlements. That's my proposition to Ignacio. But with that in mind, I'm going to continue to say informal settlements because that's the language you are going to encounter during your professions, and I want to prepare you to uh, engage uh, effectively in this conversation. And I suspect, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, this is more a problem with the discipline than it is something great about Wentworth. I suspect that the people you work with during your careers won't have a clue about any of this because they didn't study this in architecture school. So uh, it's going to be up to you to help bring the profession up to speed in these issues. So five things, five attributes uh, that constitute informal settlement. What does it take to be designated an informal settlement? Number one, <clears throat> insecurity of land titles. So title insecurity. And this is also called land tenure. So um, in the United States, there are three forms of property ownership. I own my land, fee simple ownership. I rent my land. I don't own it, but I have rights to it that are negotiated month in, month out. And condominium. I own the, the property within the sheetrock finishes of the unit, but the structure and the land it sits on is, is owned in common. Three, in the rest of the world, there are 30, 40, 50, depending on how you define it, there are dozens of different levels of land rights. Oh, I need that. There are uh, dozens of different levels of land rights, uh, uh, and it's not about ownership. And so that's part of the background to the reading, is that someone might have the right, they might own the building, but not the land. They might uh, rent the building and get taxed on the building. There's just so many different nuances of land rights and ownership. Um, and you read in the reading one case in which the title, the person thought he was getting free, uh, fee simple ownership through a legal title, but it turns out to be a scam. United States and Canada and uh, places in Europe are the, are the rare exception to the rule where uh, free and clear land titles are dependably established by municipal governments and lawyers. Number two, water. Uh, if there's a WhatsApp channel, uh, is there a WhatsApp channel? Is everybody on WhatsApp? Was that your job, Issa? <laughs> so if there's a WhatsApp channel, I can give you an article uh, from the New York Times. Did I send that to you? The New York Times published an article on the water merchants of uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. So uh, the municipality, the pipes don't supply enough water for the population. And so these uh, merchants of water, they, they take their truck to the river, they pump water out of the river, and then they go through the neighborhoods and they sell water at 40 times the cost from the pipe. <coughs> and people who are purchasing water this way in the informal settlements throughout the world have to pay 40 times as much as the people in the formal settlements who are getting their water through pipes. Does that sound familiar? Does that happen in Guatemala City? And so uh, imagine uh, spending a quarter of your income in some places, imagine spending half of your income to get water. Not cool. That is the situation. And um, what is the United Nations standard for one person per day? 20 liters of water within, 
within walking distance, within easy walking distance, which might be a half hour, the half hour rule. Now the half hour rule, that is an urban form force. That is a driver of urban form. So 20 liters per person per day. That is the standard of access to water. Does that mean you can uh, drink that water? Can you drink that water? No. It is a weird exceptional case that you turn on the tap, put your glass under it, and you drink the water. Do you drink the water in Cairo? No. Do you drink the water in Guatemala City? No. Is that weird? It would be weird for you guys because you're used to drinking the water. But it's not weird for the rest of the world. Most of the human population does not drink the water from, right from whatever source it is. It gets boiled or filtered. You filter. You boil? No, you get bottled water. The truck comes and you get a jug. Filter. Um, most people boil the water, then drink it. But of those 20 liters per day, how much of it do you need for uh, consumption, for cooking and eating? Well, there's the, you, you athletes, how much do you drink? Where's David? How much do you drink a day? 64 ounces? How many liters is that? Two liters, we're friends, more or less two liters, right? So, but then there's also eating. There's also eating, so maybe four liters for eating, and uh, what's 20 minus four? 16 liters for uh, washing, bathing, all your other needs. So that's the water standard. Um, a very closely related factor is toilet. Um, I was taught, uh, and I'm, I apologize if this gets too technical, I was taught in my planning courses that the rule number one of planning, and please forgive my technical language, don't shit where you eat. Okay? Friends don't let friends. <laughs> right? So, so these two are related. Um, and it's a problem in a lot of places because um, sewers are the exception. Once again, just as we flip, uh, we should call it formal settlements and settlements. We should call it holes in the ground is normal. And sewer systems are the exception throughout human history. It is very rare to have a municipal sewer system. Very rare when we talk about humans. And that's what we try to talk about in this course, is a global perspective. And so um, that's why, after solving the malaria problem, thank you very much, Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates, they have turned their attention to toilets. They have uh, offered huge sums of money to whoever can create a toilet Yeah. And he talks about the whole from the initiation of the plan until it was done of the toilet. Fantastic. Could you please share that on the WhatsApp channel? We have it. We, it happened while we were talking. That what WhatsApp channel is up and running? It's Pretty sure the movie is just called Bill Gates. Yeah, it's on Netflix. Okay. Please share that. I'm going to forget. So I need it on WhatsApp. Okay? Um, so toilet. Toilet is number three. Uh, the flying toilet, they didn't call it that in the reading, did they? They did call it that? What's the flying toilet? No. Uh, it's, it's the condition, and I'm really sorry, maybe I shouldn't. Is this okay? It's very technical. So uh, kids uh, or humans, when they need to uh, drop a deuce, how do you, like go number two, 
right? People, I, I, some of my best friends go number two, so I, I feel comfortable talking about it a little bit. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a flying toilet is when you uh, have to do number two, you squat over a plastic bag, and when you're finished, you do it, and then it's, it's a flying toilet. It's what some people do with their dog uh, excrement. That's a technical term I can use, I think. Defecation, excrement, we're all professionals. So, having access to uh, a toilet that safeguards the water supply. That is very important because friends don't let friends. Um, number four, what is number four? Overcrowding, so density. <clears throat> Who lives in a dorm? How much square footage do you have for you? Less than 200 square feet? Like, is that a, a good number? Does that, um, does that include your access to a shared kitchen? So, so that's your private, do you live in a single? Double. Double. And the room is 400 square feet? No, I think it's under 200. OK, so 100 square feet. Yeah. Well, it just feels smaller because, you know, Tanner. Actually, I'm lucky I'm not with him anymore. He's on co-op and he's not here. So it feels bigger now? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah, and I also moved to a bigger room. Excellent, excellent. So what do you think the UN standard for uh, space, your share per person, space per person? Nine feet by nine feet. What is that in meters? Three point two point nine by three. So like three Whoa. feet by three. Whoa. Feet. Whoa. Good for an American. Yeah, right? So the UN standard for your personal space is five square meters. What is five square meters in square feet? Here's what I recommend. If you can manage the math, add a zero and call it square feet. Okay? That's the rule of thumb. So 200 square feet is how many square meters? Here's, here's a hint. If you want to go from square feet to square meters, take away a zero. Right, so 20 square meters. Um, now, uh, this includes any shared access to a kitchen or anything. This is aggregate per person, five square meters, 50 square feet per person. Anything greater than that is overcrowding, okay? Just to get a sense, how big is 50 square feet? Is that 50 by 50? No. Mm -hmm. No. <clears throat> it's square root of? Five by 10. <clears throat> it's five by 10, thank you. That's easier math. It's five by 10. It's like, it's about. It's your wingspan is like 10 feet that way. Yeah. No, this is six, man. <laughs> this is six, seven and a quarter by seven and a quarter. And then number five, and this gets to the issue of building code or housing. You can't have both. Self built housing. <coughs> so if you are building it yourself, it's DIY housing. So if you satisfy three of these, it's considered informal. Okay, so you're writing that down, you're gonna look at it, and someday in the future, you're gonna internalize it, and then at the moment of truth, which could be three years from now, it could be 30 years from now, uh, your team is gonna say, what is informal, someone on your team, and it might be your boss, what does informal settlements even mean? And what are you gonna do? 
you're going to say, <laughs> here's what informal settlements mean. Boom, 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 boom. Slam, right? They're going to get schooled on, on what you have to offer that team. And guess who's going to get the promotion uh, next month? That's right. So there's a whole nother situation, which is the juxtapositions of great wealth and great want. And the architectural character of the dividing line itself. And the implication of armed guards that are protecting the 1% uh, here and the 99% there. Probably the armed guards are well-paid members of the 99%. Probably the, the middle-level staff of the local um, minister of housing probably lives here. Because the, the workforce of these cities lives here, the elite, the 1% lives here, and the, even if the workforce of the government lives here, their job, day in, day out, all day long, is to protect the interests of the people who live here. That's how the world works. So what do we do in the United States? <clears throat> we build public housing. But how did that go? The soundtrack is from Philip Glass. This is from the movie Koi Anastatsa. This is that moment, do we talk about uh, the death of modernism? So this is the moment that Charles Jenks identified as being the death of modernism. Um, and we saw this before, right? So modernism, according to Charles Jenks, ended at 3.32 p.m. on July 15, 1972, when the municipal authorities of St. Louis, Missouri, abandoned the modernist project of public housing. They said it's not working. The only solution is to end it. But that turns out to be a myth. Uh, well, what Charles Jenks was saying, the myth part of what Charles Jenks was saying, is that um, <clears throat> architecture failed. <coughs> Modern architecture failed. That's why uh, the real estate price uh, for the, if there are two houses on the market, one is a nice uh, split level colonial ranch, um, and the other is mid-century modern. The modern house will sell for a lower price and take longer to sell than the split level colonial ranch, whatever, uh, house. Even though they were built at the same time, at the same size, same, same lot, same amenities, modern architecture has been given a bad name because of its association with the failed project of public housing in the United States. So this is part of the reason why informality uh, has taken off, is because big governments that seem to be capable of doing just about anything uh, during the Great Acceleration, and this is, um, this is an important term, uh, sometimes historians <coughs> used to talk about, and we still talk about the post-war period, right? But really in terms of if this course is being taught in the context of the Anthropocene, then we need to get comfortable referring to the Great Acceleration. This is, um, how do you spell this? Am I spelling it right? Yeah. Is that right? Be one okay. Thank you. Thank you, friends. So the Great Acceleration started after World War II. It's when how did the how did the U.S. and England and France win World War II? We accelerated faster than the Axis powers. We accelerated faster than Japan. We accelerated faster than Germany. 
Uh, and so we were able to accelerate our way into industrial production, incredible industrial production never before seen in human history. We accelerated our way into making more tanks, more bombers, more jets. We accelerated our way to the post-war uh, victory and the growth period. And we accelerated our way into the, the crisis of the Anthropocene, the global climate change. It's, a, it's two sides of the same coin. Thank you, Great Acceleration. God damn you, Great Acceleration. The problems of the 21st century are by and large the, result, the direct or indirect result of the great successes of the 20th century. So the, all the great things that architects and designers and planners were able to achieve in the 20th century, uh, thank you very much, 20th century, and God damn you, 20th century, because the unintended consequences of the great successes of the 20th century are the largest problems of the 21st century. As an ambassador from the 20th century, I'm here to apologize on behalf of humanity in the 20th century. And here are some hints on what you might want to try going forward. Uh, sorry, but it's insufficient to solve the problems that we created. Uh, the best we can do is to gear you up to explore boldly and figure things out beyond what we were able to figure out and wish you luck. Which is the theme of my teaching career. So, but back to public housing. Developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded, collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live. It was a very beautiful place, like a big a hotel resort, I'd say. It was like uh, an oasis in the desert. All this newness. It was I a good thing. I Public housing, good. At that time, I was surrounded. Well, one day we woke up and it was all gone. The experiment had gone terribly around. It was just uncontrollable. So it was the greatest thing, and then it was the worst thing. Was it architecture to blame? Now we're back to Frank Gehry's Bill Bauer effect. Architecture was a part of it, but to blame architecture is to give architecture way too much credit. Fundamentally, at the core of the problem of public housing was the failure of governments, uh, the fail it was a, politi a failure of political will to uh, support and maintain the quality of maintenance, the quality of services, and to be a good landlord. Just really basic stuff. Pipes would break and they wouldn't get fixed. And water would come down the stairwells, the heating would be out, the water would freeze. It was a dangerous place for families. The families moved out. The white families moved out. <clears throat> then it became an instrument of racist public policy, which is the story of the United States in the Great Acceleration. So there are, it, was it architecture? Yes, it was architecture, but it was also these other forces that were historically important to recognize as architects in the United States. So this is a, a very small snapshot in the United States, the wealthiest country, the most successful country in the world, where the government, even in the United States and during the Great Acceleration, proved absolutely incapable of being the source of formal, affordable housing. Think about that. So if the United States, during the economic boom 
of the 50s and 60s and 70s proved incapable of providing housing for the, its population. What chance do the emerging countries coming out of uh, colonialism in Africa, Asia, South America, Latin America, what hope do those countries have? We didn't have rampant corruption, uh, but yet we couldn't do it. We had corruption, but not at the scale you see in these other places. We couldn't do it. What's the hope for these other places? Public housing strategies throughout the world became non-viable. And when they, when they did happen, what, what the governments would do is they would go into a squatter settlement, uh, dislocate people, build nice formal housing towers that look, the architecturally might be identical to this. And then they would subsidize the cost of owning and living in these houses. But you, you can subsidize uh, residents of this formal housing only if they have a steady job and it's worth subsidizing them. So in the end, the beneficiaries of public housing throughout the rest of the world, and in the rest of the world it's called social housing. So the people who moved into the social housing projects throughout Latin America, Africa, and Asia, uh, with the exception of Singapore, were the wealthiest 20%. So, uh, or, uh, so it wasn't the majority of these places. It was the wealthiest 20% who benefited from these, these housing schemes. So basically, failure. So that's why informality turned out to be the solution. Now I'm going to show you, we're going to end with the most positive example of informal settlements, uh, which is in uh, Indonesia. So I graduated from architecture school. I worked for IMP Associates. I worked for a series of architecture firms. And then the Great Recession hit. There was a recession, not the Great Recession of 2008. We're talking decades earlier. But there was a downturn in the building industry. And uh, I was also interested in studying things overseas. I thought I, was, I learned Italian. I was going to go to Italy. But then uh, my attention was attracted to a city in Java. So I got a three-month grant to go study the architecture and urban form of this town on the island of Java in Indonesia. And um, I ended up staying for four years, in part because I found a really cheap place to live in the informal settlement of this town. So for four years, I lived in an informal settlement it was very comfortable. $13 a month was my rent. And these guys would sell food from these carts or from these, uh, from these stores uh, that were lining the alleys. And it was the most delicious food I have ever tasted. And I could stuff myself for 30 cents. Why ever leave? I don't know why I'm not there right now. <laughs> and it's a place of great happiness and dignity. Uh, sure, they have to boil their water, but they have water. Sure, they, uh, when they do their business, it goes into a dry well, um, but it's managed enough so that you can boil the water and drink it. Um, they Sure, they have title insecurity, but they have banded together as a political entity where they can collectively negotiate with the government. And they actually have a high degree of security, even though they don't have uh, uh, titles the way we would expect it. Yeah. I have a question. Like, so we're saying that like our society is much better than theirs, but like I'd say probably like a vast majority of people that live in Boston don't own titles to their apartments. So how does that make Boston or any other large city better than any of these that don't have these? Exactly. So this is the challenge, is how do you compare? 
Well, at least to speak upon that, I feel like it's because of the mentality that we have in America. Um, like, we are a capitalistic society, so, like, it's all about profit, and it's kind of like, in the reading last night, it was, like, we established, like, title rights mm-hmm. as, like, of one to, like, engage in capitalism. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like you need to have property and, like, you know, like, it's kind of like not thinking about, like, I don't know, like, that's why it's, like, difficult to, like, introduce these, like, title rights to, like, these places. Well, the, the, the simplest answer is this is how we measure things. So if you look at per capita income, um, we're undeniably, there's no debate, we're better off per capita income. We are so much better off if all you care about is per capita income. So that's the short answer. But it, uh, my experience living here undermined and called into question everything about that. Um, here's a quick look at something that uh, emerged uh, from these daily struggles of humans living in these conditions. But once you understand them, the challenge as an architect is to how do we, uh, in, the, in the context of formal settlements, reproduce something as rich and wonderful as what exists in these informal settlements. So um, here's an analysis done by an Indonesian student uh, where they looked at the households. Uh, It's an informal settlement, but after building the houses, they established these property lines, and she has tidied up the raggedness of all the edges. And then she did an analysis of the interconnection between the people who live here their economic and social activities, and how this works as this kind of symbiotic uh, organism where people, when they need something, they need iced tea, they need some ramen noodles, they need some soap to do the laundry. All their needs are being taken care of in the neighborhood, uh, just like the one I lived in. Plus, if this is adjacent to the business district, which it is, at lunchtime, people leave their glass Uh, uh, air-conditioned office buildings. They remove their winter coats and sweaters because it's air-conditioned into a wintry feel inside. They come out into the 95 degree weather and they come over and they have some of that great food for 30 cents. And uh, because it's mixed use, what we would call mixed use, the people who live here have shops on the front of their houses. This is a furniture maker. This is a noodle seller. She makes concrete blocks. She does laundry. You know, so there's a, a rich, vibrant economic activity that happens in the front of everybody's houses. So as they take care of their economic business, they don't have to shuttle uh, young children off to daycare. They just take care of the children right there. And when they have to go get some more laundry soap, They just say, hey, Phyllis, can you take care of uh, Jenny and Timmy? And they say, sure, I got them. And there's this like symbiotic thing because of the architecture, because there's not this functional zone separation of activities. It's not single use zoning where you have to get in a car and drive an hour and a half to get to work. And so this analysis shows the symbiotic relationship between all the different residents and the rich collection of services they offer the city around it. And um, there's a whole thing that I might tack on to the beginning of uh, the next lecture just to do justice to it. Because you may know that Wentworth has a very special relationship with Caracas, Venezuela. And it includes a lot of studio work that has been done up to and including uh, the work of the senior studio last, maybe I just cut to that. There's Manuel Delgado's award-winning entry for the competition. He collaborated with the most prominent architects of Medellin, Colombia. Have you heard of what's happened? Oh yeah, you know all about Medellin, Colombia, right? So the most famous architects doing all that work in Medellin, Colombia. They teamed up with Manuel Delgado 
they entered a, an international competition to design this park, and they won it. And it's just waiting for a stable government to implement. So this is the personification, the exemplification of all the highest and best values that we are so interested in uh, in Medellin, Colombia, waiting to be implemented here in Caracas, Venezuela. Then there's the work of the seniors uh, last fall, resulting in a collaboration between uh, I guess three or four students that developed this um, proposal uh, for Caracas, Venezuela. We did it in collaboration with uh, the former faculty here at Wentworth who now live and organize these communities in Caracas, Venezuela. Um, so we have multiple faculty. We used to have a flow of students from Caracas to the United States, to Wentworth, and back again. Um, so now, because of the political situation, we're limited um, in what we can do. But um, that model, did you see that model up in the studio? It was sick. So, um, any questions? Maybe I, you know, so this is, this is the punchline of the Caracas thing. It's a very strong relationship. It is, represents, if, if you can figure out how to address these problems with high quality architecture as uh, Wentworth students prior to you have done so effectively, including this project that I love to show whenever I can, right? Remember that one? That was the sophomore studio in 2009 with 110 students and nine faculty, um, all of whom should have gone to Caracas, but we couldn't go, we couldn't take the students there, so all nine faculty should have gone to Caracas, but Wentworth couldn't do that, so all of Manuel and I went to Caracas <laughs> and um, took thousands of photos in this very dangerous neighborhood in order to produce uh, this work that we were able to do. So any questions about anything? Is, do you have target questions? Uh, does anyone have a burning target question that, w that now must be answered moving forward? Or should that be part of the next assignment? Does anyone have any questions about uh, what to choose for the analysis? If you want to talk to me after class, please do. Okay. Guys, send me your numbers, please. How do we send you our numbers? 781. <laughs> Two nine six four. Seven one. Two nine six four. Two nine six four. You want to do a text or WhatsApp? Um. Yeah, WhatsApp is better. I'll just do like a text through WhatsApp so you can have us. She is the expert.
Yeah, I'm gonna ask like, what should I target for the, like, I, you should like do Cairo? Yeah, like, I was thinking of a project over there, like, I work with an Avisa project mm -hmm. that Norman Foster then designed, like, when I position for design in this area, mm -hmm. directly in downtown Cairo. Is there an aspect of informality? Uh, in yeah, it's totally for informal sentiment in the middle of downtown, like surrounded by the old downtown that the, the French people designed the, the for right. before. To get ready for Yeah, but right now visit, it's right? totally demolished. But right now it's totally demolished? Yeah, it's totally down. So uh, why don't you... Uh, I exempt you from the usual rules, which is... You can't do architectural proposals, you have to do something that's built. I will exempt you from that rule if you can show us what was proposed and how it's supposed to work. Yeah, like what Norman Foster proposed. Yes. Yeah. What your team proposed, this is what it's going to do, especially the aspects that are supposed to spread benefits to the informal So actually what we, what we were doing is like we, we were like walking through the space a lot of time. Like we spent like almost, I spent with them like seven months in mm -hmm. the, 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 like the architect himself that I was working with him. Mm -hmm. He spent like almost four, three years in wow. this space. Mm -hmm. Like to know every, so he knows every single so one. Research, right? yeah. He knows all the people. All the people so living there. Yeah, and good. he knows her needs, their needs, and everything. Good, good. So that's what I mean. Like, to yeah. involve more of those people. Yeah. Do. So if your sense of being more of a report, we'll just be grateful. Just a report of what? It could be just a report, unless you see an opportunity for analysis. Yeah, because this is too valuable to pass on, right? Yeah, so I mean the location of it, and it's right in front of the river. Yeah. So. Can you make a one-minute video that shows it? Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'd like that. Cool. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I want to show you my um, uh, sketch writing because this is actually better for me than the video. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, saw, I saw the comments on, okay, on, good. On, the last, on the last one. Mm -hmm. and, um, so the, the first part. Okay. So, uh, actually, the first thing you do is outline. Did you do an outline? I outline the points by writing, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Them, Thank you. Write freedom, but then I come back and just add whatever. So, here's what you should do you should take the reading and go, okay, the prologue is, okay, he's talking about four cities. So, you do. You know, so you list the four cities, boom, 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 even before you read it. Then you go, and then you, then, uh, then he talks about themes that tie together the whole book, and then you, so you, you know, uh, so you write informality. So it's five sections for the prologue. Then you go to chapter nine, and you say improper settlements, improper settlers. So you use the title that the author used. But then uh, you say, okay, this is all about, you haven't read anything yet. You're just flipping through the pages and, and getting a sense of what's there. And you write an outline without reading anything. You just see what the headings are, you see what the topics are. You see, okay, he's talking about philosophers here, and then he goes back to Turkey, and then he talks about philosophers again. So you, you just make an outline. So that's the first step, outline. I, I I did that last time, but I didn't like outline each point. I like, outlined the important stuff, like you said, into the yeah. stick stuff. And go right. On. But um, when I saw your comment, I thought I this outline should be my ideas. So that's why, like I I identified all the things, but I didn't write them because they're already in the writing. I just write what I have on them. Or it's not like that. Well, you do that, but the first step is to make an outline for the whole thing, okay. and, you're, you're gonna, and you're going to have to change it as you actually read it. Okay. But you just do a rough outline, just to give you a sense of what, what you dare ask of the reading, and then you write the target questions. So it's outline first, target questions. So based on, I haven't, I just glanced at it, I haven't read anything 
Uh, I have the right to expect from this reading, just from my skimming, um, uh, what is it like to live in uh, these places? So that's the target question. I expect this reading to help me understand what it's like to, and, and why people choose it. And, uh, are they choosing, or maybe it's a simpler question. Are they choosing it or are they forced? So those are, those are questions and that's enough. You have your target questions. So now when you start reading it, you are not uh, a captive. You're not a captive to the reading. You are an agent. You, are, you have a target. So you go in and you get this and you get that and you see other things and you grab those too and you put them in there. And you put it in as, as quickly and as succinctly as you can and you give it a page number. And you don't page number your thinking. You give a page number to what you captured. Okay. And then in the brackets, first you, you do a new line. Then you put your thinking and no page number. Okay. So paraphrase, page numbers. You don't have to write the word page. And then new line, square brackets. This is totally messed up, man. <laughs> right? Or, or something specific. How can the government justify doing this to its people? No question mark. Then you move on and you capture it is in one sentence what the next page says, so the next three pages, and, and you continue in that way. And then you ignore Ismar because I don't care about his whining. Stop whining, Ismar. Right? I want to know about Aristotle, De Soto, and I don't care about these other philosophers. Aristotle and DeSoto. Those are the two I care about. Or actually, I like Proudhome. I like what he says about property versus possession. That's an interesting point. So you grab that one and you ignore the rest. Does that make sense? Yes. And also, uh, one more thing. Is it, do you think it's, it's possible to, to uh, post a reading from today for the next one? For the, so the one we will get on, on Wednesday? So I can do it on the weekend? Because it takes me way longer. To read. Well, what I've been doing is um, by the time. Uh, oh, yes, I can do that. I will do that. All right. And also, I told you that there's a way for your phone. Um, you said, can you call the group City 20? Yeah. Because I think I already have a group called Urbanism. City Isn't that weird? 20. Um, so I do this when I have a reading. I do. Photo copies of old title deeds, and they sell the face as if they're real. A Turkey's version of the gorillas of Brazil. This particular portion of Parky. I so I just, particularly complex. I just open the reading oh. on my phone, okay. and then I. As a PDF. How do you do that? PDF, uh, and then if it's if it's on the screen and it's an Apple phone, do you have an Apple device? Yes. Apple device. Yeah. Apple mm -hmm. device. Two fingers. Photocopies of old title deeds, oh, and they sell wow. the fakes as if they're real. What? Yeah, turkeys, the <laughs> and you can slow it down or speed up. Face is a particularly complex that's, that's what I mean. <laughs> slow you down, Jesus. I can't understand a word you're saying. That's too slow. <laughs> that's too slow. Speed up. From the center of Cartel, okay. More than five kilometers away, down on the coast, the sea of Marmara, okay. indeed, or, Sultan Bili, an entire I don't have time for this. Independent city stands between Kaki <laughs> and Gato. Sultan Bili. That's how I like, I like read. I'm just like, okay, okay, highlight, okay. <laughs> so that's in the accessibility settings. Uh, text, uh, maybe it's called speech. I don't know. I don't know what operating system you're using, but it's changed in the new operating system. Yeah, I can, I can find the way. So I'll I'll make the reading available now. Yeah, that'll be really good because it's it's just in the, during the weekend I can do that because yeah Wednesday three ends at five but then th Thursday I need to do both yeah and it's, and it's and it's better to do the reading one more time one time if like you, this whole yeah. thing one time. Me, David, Xavier, and Carol we have a study room so that like right after class we meet together and stuff. If you want, we can add you to like. Oh, that's yeah, a great idea. Study room, because we know it's kind of hard, because we have like studio, then that. 
Sure. So yeah, and, and yeah, 